I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You may be seated. Notice to the public. All matters listed under the consent agenda will be considered by the retirement trust in order to be routine to be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless members of the retirement trust board or persons in the audience request Okay, so do we have a motion to uh, accept the consent agenda with the amendment for uh, is it item number three to change Gregorio Garcia to Gregoria Garcia? I make a motion. Motion made by Mario. Second, Second by Rebecca. Uh, Pressy? Aye. Rebecca? Aye. Mario? Aye. Robert? Aye. Cassandra? Yes. And Nick. Aye. Okay, motion passes. Okay, going to the regular agenda, item seven, discussion and action regarding the treasurer's report for the month ended May 31st, 2018. Louis Meyer presenting. Good morning, Louis Meyer, Treasury Services Coordinator, Office of the Comptroller. <clears throat> Excuse me. On behalf of Pat Degman, Comptroller. Beginning on the statement of net assets available for benefits, fiscal year 2018 through May 31st. Cash and investments increased by 32.1 million. Unrestricted receivables are up by 7.2 million. Amounts due for securities purchased up seven, 12, excuse me, 12.7 million. Overall liabilities up by 11.5 million. And net assets available for benefits up 27 Point seven million. Continuing on to statement of changes in net assets available for benefits for the nine months ended, contributions were thirty one point seven million, interest in dividends five point three million, net change in fair value of investments increased by forty point four million. Benefits paid to retirees, 43.3 million. And again, the overall increase, 27.7 million. On the quarterly statement of changes in net assets available for benefits, for the quarter ended May 31st, contributions were 11.7 million. The monthly average for the nine years in the, for the nine months in the fiscal year 3.5 million per month. Fair value of investments increased in the quarter 5.4 million. On the investment income analysis, investment increased, investment income increased 5.8 million, led by 4.9 million in unrealized gains and 701,000 in realized gains. The net investment income year to date, lower left hand portion of the slide, 5.88%. Annualized, it would be 7.84%. The fund is now 78% of the way to its fiscal year 2018 net investment income target of 58.2 million. Beginning with the charts, 
This chart provides a graphical representation of the fiscal year cumulative investment income and it shows two consecutive fiscal years along with the corresponding cumulative income target. So we would begin, we go through the fiscal year cumulative, we reach the end, we start over, and then we continue again. On the next chart, the net investment income rate of return, similar to the prior chart, it presents a graphical representation of the fiscal year cumulative rate of return for two fiscal years and the corresponding cumulative rate of return target. On refunds and administrative expenses, administrative expenses show to be relatively constant. <clears throat> excuse me, for the fiscal years 2013 through 2017, right to left. Administrative expenses for 2018 are for nine months and are unadjusted. The 2018 administrative expenses <coughs> contain approximately 1.5 million in costs that will be capitalized. They relate to 1 million of construction costs and 450,000 of software costs. Once those costs are capitalized, the, admin the administrative expenses will be in line with prior fiscal years. Refunds for fiscal year 2018 are 1.89 million, which annualized would place them at approximately 2.5 million. And finally, on the chart for deductions, benefits paid to retirees, it provides a graphical representation of the increasing amounts paid to retirees that have been discussed in prior meetings. Annualizing 2018, okay. yeah. we would be at 57.8 million for the current fiscal year, which places it approximately equal to fiscal year 2017. Okay, Are there any questions? Questions or comments? I just want to thank uh, Financial Services and Lewis and Charlie for uh, putting these additional graphs in. I like that they're colored and I, I think they tell a story. And so uh, I appreciate their help with that. Yes, sir. First, first month trying this out. So if any of the board members or committee members have any suggested tweaks, by all means, let Robert know and um, we can work on it. But it's a, it's a, it's a good graphic representation. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, well, I guess if we have no comments, uh, we're good for now. Thank you. Thank you. Item 8, discussion and action regarding the receipt of a report from the City of El Paso Department of Information Technology, reported by Rick Campos. Good morning. <coughs> Rick Campos. You may. Um, it's up to you. I mean, sorry. certainly if there was any, any motions or actions, you'd need a motion. We can, we can entertain a motion to accept it if you'd like, Pressy. Would you like? Okay. Yeah. So, Okay, so we have a motion to accept the report sec made by Pressy, seconded by Robert. All those in favor? Aye. Motion passes. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Rick Campos, uh, Information Technology for the Department of Information Technology. Uh, regarding uh, PTG and uh, a regular pension processing. Uh, this morning I have uh, four items. Uh, item number one, uh, periodic processing for May is in progress and almost completed. Uh, the PSB uh, data still needs to be finalized. Uh, item number two, uh, PeopleSoft uh, an automated file transfer for PTG is in progress for the PeopleSoft uh, retiree payroll and the other one is the active payroll file for 
uh, regular city employees. Uh, that's being finalized and uh, that will be moved forward uh, within the next couple of weeks. Uh, do we have any initial idea of how that's going yet or it's do going we won't well. know? It's going, it's going well. well. Uh, we had a little, a few hiccups, but we're good. Uh, we're just doing testing now. Uh, item number three, uh, unit acceptance testing uh, is in progress uh, by the Pension Administration Group for uh, PTG uh, implementation. And item number four, uh, ADP uh, retiree extract file has been provided by ADP and testing is in progress with PTG. Those are the four items that I have today unless there are any questions. Robert, anything else to add to that? Robert Ash, Pension Administrator. Uh, we have another item on the agenda that deals with a contract amendment for PTG. But as far as user acceptance testing is going, uh, it's been going on for months now. Uh, we're in the kind, kind of final stages at this point. We're actually having three parallel, complete parallel tests for three solid months. We expect that testing to be done at the end of July, beginning of August, at which time, if it's successful, we plan on going live. Uh, and that, that will trigger some payments a month from then. But uh, it's, it's a, an enhancement to what we had under PeopleSoft. Uh, the pension administration system has taken a lot of work on the part of staff, especially IT and PTG and, and Alma's group and David's group to, to get up and going. A um, lot of testing involved, a lot of pieces of data that are getting moved and tested and massaged, but uh, I can see some efficiencies will come out of that in the end. So uh, we're, we're almost there, we're getting close. Good. Okay, any other questions or comments? Okay, thank you, Rick. Okay. Item nine, discussion and action regarding the receipt of a report from the trust construction consultant, Stephen Smith. Good morning, this is Steve Schmitz. Um, I'm gonna start with the exterior. The, um, they're working on the, the site concrete, um, the, um, the gas, water, and sewer um, utility lines have been installed. Um, we're still waiting, the only one we're, or two of them we're waiting on is the electrical and then spectrum, which is bringing in the TB. Um, the, uh, the electric company has um, drilled or, or dug the holes for the poles. So as soon as they get out there and start setting the poles, um, I can, I'll ask Robert to call for the electric meter. Um, the electrician has run the underground for the light standards and the monument sign and stuff like that. Um, they have not done the sleeves for the landscaping yet. And um, the exterior stone is still being worked on and they started the, the wood siding. I think they just probably just the other day or so because the first time I saw it. Um, on the interior, they're coming along pretty well. They've got most of the painting. The first coat of the, where well, there's two finished coats, but the first coat is, is painted in most of the building. The ceiling grid they've been putting up is probably about 65 to 70% complete. So at that point, they're ready for the electrician and the heating cooling, but they weren't there yesterday yet. Um, they are installing some um, ceramic tile in the restrooms and oh and the roofer is working on the entrance canopy do y'all have any questions slow and steady huh I was a little disappointed that there was no light fixtures on the job yesterday. So what's the latest timeline you think will be moving in and will it conflict with going live on these other three IT projects for the, how are you gonna balance that or what are you thinking? Robert Ash, Pension Administrator, IT has agreed to help us transition the computer equipment over to the new office. Uh, I don't have a date when we'll move in yet. Uh, as far as uh, our going live with PTG and the pension administration system. Uh, obviously, we can do that at either location, but there may be a two or three days over a weekend, I would assume that we're down, but I don't think it'll 
by then most of the testing should be done okay. that's what i'm thinking the good thing is they're getting new furniture and everything so literally the only thing they'll have to move over will be their Lines. their their pcs and everything will be good to go so fortunately for that and the it guy's in great shape i mean you even got card readers up now you know they haven't set the equipment because um, we've asked for a date where the the building is permanently locked up because it's just kind of semi locked up right now. But I know they put the card reader equipment in last week. S Steve, I think you mentioned that the the fiber had been cut by one of the contract subs. Uh, um, is, has that been? It's not the fiber. It's copper. It's AT and T's line that goes into the building. Oh, okay. So it wasn't when they the... pulled that sidewalk out, they broke the line, but. <laughs> The way AT&T did it was they didn't bury the line. I mean, it was like a couple inches under. <clears throat> and then they ran it through a crack in that old sidewalk. Oh, okay. So they really did. So that has that been addressed then already? Yeah, that's okay. been already repaired. Okay. And right now they're working on that sidewalk. Um, they may have inspection called for that, that, that city sidewalk for either today or tomorrow. Okay. Because it's formed. Okay. Well, any other questions or comments all right thank you Steve thank you all have a good day okay. item 10 discussion and action authorizing the pension administrator to provide notice of vacancy to Sun Metro at the appropriate time Robert Ash pension administrator in our current lease with Sun Metro for our current office facilities uh, I've provided you a copy of Article 10 dealing with the expiration of the lease and 10.2 specifically dealing with termination. And basically we have to give them 90 days of notice in advance of our date of termination. And we don't have a completion date yet at the building. I assume that it would probably be within 90 days now. I'm not for certain about that. Uh, but since we only meet once a month, uh, I believe the idea here is that if you allow me or grant me the authority to do it, then I'll provide that notice to Sun Metro uh, as soon as I know we have a good date to move in uh, so that we don't get hit with additional days outside the 90 days uh, for purposes of continuing to pay a lease payment. And that was recommended by the committee, correct? Correct. Okay. So facilities and maintenance committee. So we have a motion to accept the facility maintenance committee recommendation to allow the pension administrator to provide notice of vacancy to Sun Metro at the appropriate time. Second. Motion made by Robert, second by Sam. All those in favor? Aye. Motion passes. Item 11, discussion and action regarding approval of the job description and salary range for the position of administrative assistant. Robert Ash reporting. David, you want to help me with this? It's on the, okay, it's on the treasure. Do you want me to open up the tool or just the presentation? Just the presentation. Can you use the arrow buttons, right? It's the arrows, or you could also use the mouses. Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, board members. This item deals with hiring an additional staff member uh, when we open the new office. And we knew that we were going to have an additional need for staffing when the office was open. And this additional person is gonna be responsible as, as the gatekeeper to our office. It's an important position because this is the first person someone will see when they walk through the door. And so welcoming guests, retirees, participants, um, is gonna be really important. We basically have two sides of the office. This will be right in the middle. And when we first started talking about this, we were talking about a receptionist, uh, just a, a clerical person. And my thoughts on this have changed over time to the point where I think that we'd have greater efficiencies if we were to hire an administrative assistant. And the reason for that is uh, they'll be able to do multiple jobs within the office. Uh, if you look at other major departments within the city, um, they all basically have some type of administrative assistance, and they take care of logistics, 
they take care of a lot of uh, things that are important to the functioning uh, of any department or office within the city. Because of that increased demands based on an administrative assistant as opposed to a receptionist, we think that that'll increase the productivity of the total department or the office. Because I would expect that this person would be able to do more than receive people do minimal scanning as we, we talked about originally. So these more complex activities, job duties, uh, will come from the executive staff and management, but really will be able to offset some of the demands, especially if there's people that are missing on the other side of the building. And so we would expect this administrative assistant to supplement the executive management team, which would be me and the deputy administrator, and responsible for projects as well as just ministerial duties. The reporting of this person will be reporting to me. It won't be reporting to the supervisors at this point. And so I'll, I'll have direct contact with this person on a daily basis. So what are the jobs that we anticipate this administrative assistant would do, which would be different than a receptionist? Prioritize internal and external communications. And we're talking about board pack and emails. We're talking about conference calls and meetings and all kinds of communication between not only us as staff and board, but with outside people as well. We're talking about investment managers, we're talking about actuaries, we're talking about auditors, attorneys, consultants, and, and of course people at the city. They'll be able to organize and arrange th these meetings, uh, maintain the boardroom schedule so there's no conflicts, uh, and of course continue with some administrative duties dealing with the meetings. When you arrange meetings with the city management and trust representatives, I can tell you that this is kind of stressful and a logistical nightmare from time to time because there are so many moving parts at the city and they have so many competing uh, obligations that sometimes these meetings are canceled or recanceled or sometimes they're joint meetings and, and it really takes someone that has the character and the wherewithal to be able to get this done effectively. Part of this job will be setting up meetings, dealing with equipment, presentation books, of course, we want them to be professional, but the cross-training with cross training for duties with other staff, I think, is what really sets us apart from a clerical or a receptionist type person. If we bring in the administrative assistant, um, obviously they're going to have more responsibility than a, a receptionist would, but we also have more qualifications that will be required. We're looking for someone with a bachelor's degree and at least five years of experience or equivalent thereof, and because of that, uh, you know, we're going to have to pay them more than a receptionist would get. I've listed kind of three different salary ranges for three different positions that the city has. The city has an office assistant, 1257 to 2253 an hour is their sale, salary scale. They have an administrative assistant, 1506 to 2406 per hour. We have, city has a city executive assistant at 35 to $59 and 15 cents per hour. What we're proposing if you approve the administrative assistant, the salary range of $16.91 an hour to $30.44 an hour. The Administrative Services Committee uh, discussed this when they last met, and they are rec recommending approval of the salary and the position at this time. Included in your, your backup materials is uh, a copy of the job description, and you can see that the enhanced duties are reflected there too as well as the proposed salary range. The salary range is in between that what we pay our supervisors and what we pay our benefit techs when they come in. So that's my presentation. I'll be glad to answer any questions. Service committee recommendation, and it makes sense to me. It's a small office, and the, fund, the pension fund's getting larger and larger. I'd second. I just, maybe you can add um, as one of the duties I don't really even know if this is a duty, but at police and fire, what, um, what we, um, first of all, we're going to be very proud of this building. But it's not our building. It's, it's, the, uh, it's the employee's building. It's a retirement building, right? So I'd like to see that every person that walks in there, that when they leave, we want, they're coming in to talk to, to you all about retirement, that you give them a tour of the building. It's their building. And that's what we try to do at police and fire, just, uh, you know, some of the pride behind what we've done up to this point. It's their building. It's a good point. And the, again, this person would be at the forefront of doing that. This is the person, and obviously 
this person will need to be relieved from time to time for lunch and, and other, th and they're on vacation or sick leave. Uh, but primary focus will be, you know, the first eyes and ears that they see. And so we need the right person for this, that's for sure. And, and she'll have part of the covered part of too, right? Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> it's yet to be determined. <laughs> okay, any other questions or comments? Okay, so we have a, a motion to accept the recommendation and, uh, that was made by Nick and seconded by Sam. So do you want to pull on this? Uh, Pressy? Aye. Rebecca? Aye. Mario? Aye. Robert? Aye. Sam? Aye. Nick? Aye. Motion passes. Okay. Item 12, discussion and action regarding the dates of the November and December investment committee and board meetings. Robert Ash, pension administrator. I started receiving phone calls last month, you know, somewhat in a panic from some of our investment managers, uh, really worried about getting home uh, in their November meeting time period. Uh, we'll meet on Wednesday, Thanksgiving is on Thursday, and therefore they thought if there was a way we could move up the meeting, that would be appreciated by them, because they were just weren't sure that they were even gonna get home. Hmm. And so, it's one of the heaviest traffic days of the year. What I would propose to you uh, for consideration is that we move the board meeting and investment committee meetings originally scheduled for November 20th and 21st up a week to November 13th and 14th. And in December, uh, similarly, uh, move our meeting, which would have been on the 18th and 19th to the 11th and 12th. Uh, I need enough time to advise our managers who make travel plans well in advance that this is happening, uh, but that is for your consideration. I don't know. Um, our custodial bank requires eight or nine business days, but certainly we can supplement uh, if we can't do that at that time. So um, you're proposing November 13th for our board meeting in November? November 14th, I believe. The uh, investment Thursday? committee on the 13th, right? Thir 13th is a Wednesday. Okay, well, it'll be that Wednesday then. So it's the 12th and 13th? 12th and 13th. No, the 14th is a Wednesday. You're, you're right. I was... Okay. My, my uh, mouse got a little overactive, so I was already in 2019. <laughs> All right. November, November uh, 14th for it's a board meeting. meeting. And the committee meet, the investment committee meeting would be the day before on the 13th and then December 12th with Correct. the committee meeting on the 11th. If that's what you choose to do. Yes. We can hold our feet to the fire, but it's up to you. Okay. So do we have any, um, any comments on that? So here's, here's a different perspective. Uh, in the past, and I don't know if that's going to happen this year, the city closes the last week of the month and we need time to run the pension payroll if that's gonna happen. And so given the 25th being a holiday, trying to get that payroll run becomes a little bit problematic. It's 8.30 those Wednesdays as well. So I'll have to figure We can it out. pick another day. I mean, How about we move it back one day to the Thursdays? Or the 12th, or the Tuesdays, it's either one. I'd rather go back a day to give them more time to get to the financial You want to do it that, that week ahead, but back a day? Yeah. So that'd be Not the, Thanksgiving, right? No. Okay. No. So that would be the, the 15th of yeah. November and the 13th, 13th yes. of December. So we do Thursdays instead of Wednesday. I feel good with that. 15th of November and the 13th of November? 13th of December. I'm sorry, you have December? Press, are you out the whole week? Yeah, I, I, I think so. But no, I, I, I'll try to, I'll try to change. But you're talking December. November, December. December. He's talking December. Yeah, you November. guys are talking November. Well, but they're talking about moving December's at the same time. Right. So I think we can have maybe two motions, uh, two separate <laughs> motions. So let's let's take a motion on our November to, to put that to, to bed. So we have, do we have a motion to, uh, to change our regularly scheduled November board meeting to the 14th and the investment committee meeting to the 13th. So moved. Motion made by Sam. Uh, that's I'm sorry, did we, go, did we say Wednesday, Thursday? 
I'm sorry, did I miss that? Would, that would help me a lot, and I'd appreciate that. Okay, let me amend that motion from our regular board meeting for November 15th with the investment committee meeting on the 14th. So we agreed the meeting would be on a Thursday, the investment committee meeting would be on a Wednesday. Is that what the proposal was? Yeah, okay. So, so we have the amended motion for the 14th and 15th of November. Motion made by Sam. Second. Second by Nick. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, now let's move on to December. So what are we proposing for December? Press year out from the 10th through the 14th, you I, said? I may be out that week, but okay. I, I'll see if I can change it. But, um, so I mean, it doesn't we'll, really, we'll okay. And, and we've agreed that the 18th and 19th is not yeah. sustainable. Pressy, are you sure about that? You, you go that week? He didn't hear you, sir. Pressy, are you okay with that? December, what did you say, Carl? I'm sorry. Well, my question was, back to your original question, are we sure that we have to move the December dates? I right. can, I can. Robert. Go ahead. Oh, no, what, what was your concern, Robert? So my concern is running the pension payroll and closing that and if you look at the the calendar in december if the city were to take the last week off as it's been doing in the past that would be the week of the 24th through the 31st and if you meet on the 18th and 19th that gives us two days to run pension payroll. So could we confirm that with them and maybe we can address December next month? That's fine. And yeah, so that way we know for sure. And but then that, we can make our decision based on that. And yeah, that's the, the major issue even more than managers coming down. Then you can bring us the proposal if it, if it looks like that's not gonna work, we can consider moving it, that moving sounds it fine. forward. Okay. Mr. Ash, they, um, usually what happens is they, yeah, the city closes, but it has a, like a skeletal crew because not everybody has uh, uh, a, a time available. So they, some people are able to come in and work. That sounds bad. Right, and I don't, I don't control who at the city will be here and won't be here to work that skeleton crew. Okay, so if everyone's good with that, we can table the December item until... Uh, decision until next month is that good move the table okay Motion well, in the table the December second uh, meeting schedule change till next month uh, motion made by Presley seconded by Robert all those in favor aye, aye. Aye. okay we'll punt that one <laughs> all right uh, what's up next David item 13 discussion and action regarding approval of a resolution regarding concealed or open carry of a handgun into any meeting of the Board of Trustees or a committee of the Board of Trustees. Okay, so I'll, I'll just say a couple words and then I'll, I'll pass, uh, pass the discussion over to, uh, to Sam, uh, Robert, and Eddie if, if they wanna add anything and then we can go around the uh, dais for, for any comments. I just, uh, anticipating that we'll be in our, in our new building shortly and we'll, we'll no longer be under the umbrella of the city council chambers with regard to the concealed carry policy. Just ask Robert to work with Eddie to do some research on the, the laws and what our what our purview was on this and to bring a, a policy to the board for recommendation. And Sam asked that it be uh, added to our to our agenda for this month. So I'll let him speak on it and then um, Robert and Eddie if you want to add anything to that. Um, folks, um, I, I will tell you one of the things that uh, gives me great pause and concern is that we are moving to an isolated facility and we will not have the luxury of being in the council chambers. And um, this, this, this concealed carry or license to carry issue seems to be a big deal all over the state of Texas. Uh, I really believe that it's imperative that we, we take this in consideration that we will not have the luxury of being located here at the city and um, safety is an issue for me. Uh, and as, a, as an instructor and as someone who carries and as someone who's, who's met with uh, legal here um, to get, get an insight as to what our rights are, I think it's very important that we, we, we consider this. And um, 
So you you would be willing to give up your right to carry since you are you already you are a concealed hand, handgun carrier. Correct. And you uh, uh, you wouldn't be willing to use uh, to carry in a meeting to protect me who uh, who I don't carry. Correct. I, I I'm not willing to give that right up. I'm willing to. Uh, what I'm asking is that we adopt a resolution that allows us to carry. One of the things that most people uh, run into when it comes to this this right to carry is that uh, we 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 operate on you know <laughs> folklore uh, myths of what what the law is. The bo bottom line is we have the right to carry in these chambers. I've actually run it past legal. Legal has agreed with me on many uh, on all issues regarding the right to carry inside of City Hall. Uh, I have the right to carry not only uh, upstairs, but also have the right to carry in chambers because of my position uh, as, a, as an elected official. So what I want to do is be able to share that right with the rest of this board to carry if they so choose because we're going to be isolated. So, yeah, so just, just one second. So just to clarify what the, what the proposal we have today is really directed towards the public Correct. And, and signage directed towards the public entering the chamber, which as proposed, we are exercising our right as a board subject to the Texas Open uh, Meeting Act that we would prohibit the carry into our board by the public. This, uh, as as owners of the building and uh, uh, owners of the building, the 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 board of trustees as a whole does not relinquish their right to carry no, in that do. meeting. We do not. Correct. As 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 board members, we 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 reserve we reserve the right to carry. Well, what we want to do is make sure that we are very uh, aware of who else has the opportunity to carry into our meetings. So what we're looking at doing is restricting the public from carrying, but giving us the right to carry. And that's very important. And as Mario said, that's not in the resolution, and the silence on that is fine for what you're trying to propose. Okay. That's Thank what you. I'm asking? Yeah, exactly. I have no problem supporting it. Okay, but, but you know, I, and I'd like it to be clear that it's, you know, that you as a board member can carry, because I appreciate that. Okay. Okay? I support you 100%. Thank you. Okay? I just, you know, uh, but I'd like, if it's going to be for only the public, then, you know. Well, let's let Robert and, and Eddie uh, piggyback on this to, to clarify what, what actually the policy governs re with regard to the comments we've had. Right. Uh, Eddie Miranda, Legal Counsel. So as part of your backup material, you should have a proposed resolution that attempts to summarize what we're trying to accomplish here today. It's a basically a twofold uh, issue. One is that we want to make sure that the that the policy reflects the current law, and I think it does. And it provides uh, a provision for the posting of signage to the public, so that the public knows what what they can and cannot carry into a meeting of this board whenever it's a public meeting. And so the the prohibition against open or or concealed carry. Uh, is applicable to any meeting place, whether it's the board or a committee of the board, as long as the proper signage is posted. And, and that's all that basically this resolution attempts to do other than to summarize what the current law is. In other words, in our new boardroom and in our executive conference room where we'd be having our committee meetings, you'd have two signs posted, actually four signs if you count English and Spanish, prohibiting open and concealed carry by members of the public. Um, again, these signs, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, AD, these signs are directed to the public, not to the owners of the, the premises. Right. Okay. And the staff should already have the required uh, language in both English and Spanish that is required to be posted together with some guidelines as to the size of the signage, the, the letters and the color of the signage, the staff should already be in possession of, of those requirements. Exactly. And, and being such, it, it, there's not a requirement for it to actually be spelled out in the resolution because the way the, the law is written, 30.06 uh, prohibits us from uh, pr 
prohibits the public from carrying concealed and 30.07 prohibits the public from carrying open. Very important that we get that right. There's no r requirement or need to add uh, specific language to allow us to carry. The language in itself allows us to carry. Okay, okay. the 30.06 and the 30.07. Thank, so thank you for the clarification, yes, I appreciate sir. that. And furthermore, this would not prohibit our, our visitors from carrying in our building. Only prohibited from carrying them into one of our Change. open meetings in, in the boardroom or in the conference room. Well, that, if that's the case, then there, do we have a place, if, if they're coming in as visitors, they're gonna have to draw, and they're carrying, they will have to uh, drop it off in a secure place. Back yeah. in their vehicle, right? Uh, they, can <clears throat> they have the right to uh, leave it in their vehicles. Um, well, we have to be very specific about the signage. The 30.06, 30.07, the, the language of the law actually reads that, uh, that those signs must be placed in a highly conspicuous location. In other words, the door. <laughs> Right. Uh, okay, it's not specific as to where it has to be, but it has to be in a highly conspicuous location. In other words, we need to place this signage in, in a manner that they don't even enter the building. They, they need to know that um, they need to leave that yeah. in their, their vehicle. Taking into account what, you know, uh, Mr. Rimkus just mentioned is that they can walk in and, you know, says, and they can carry within that facility and then, but if they're going into one of our meeting rooms, then they're gonna have to uh, disarm. Well, we and so, you know, I'm just concerned about, okay, where are you gonna put the arms, you know, right. the, in, in, you know if he's already in sight? I you mean, you know, says tell him, go back and leave it in your, in your car. And, and that was addressed, um, one, of, one of the things that um, UTEP has done and the community college has done is they've actually provided lock boxes. That's okay, but, that. but, <laughs> However, <laughs> if we place a sign on the outside of the building, we don't have to worry about that. You know, bottom line, whenever I walk up to a, a facility and I see that sign before I walk into a foyer or any, any meeting place, mm -hmm. it's up to us. No, but you see what, uh, I have no problem so far, except with that point, then we need to, st you will have to have at least some, something regarding policy and procedure for directing the staff on what to do with that. Uh, I would also like to uh, piggyback something onto that, sure. okay, uh, not as part of the resolution, but as part of uh, our discussion, is that, is it possible to have uh, required training for board members and the, the staff about what to do in case of uh, um, a violation? No, well, yeah. Uh, uh, the police department went to the health department and gave us a really great presentation regarding uh, uh, active shooter. So I'd like, you know, and I, I thought that was great. If that, in that situation, and, and one, of the, one of the scenarios is somebody having a deal with a board meeting at a school board meeting you know, and I didn't know what to do that I think I think we that, could take up I, that through the facilities committee uh, facility maintenance committee if you want a policy that that would that would address active shooter training or whatever because having this building really now is our a new responsibility we're undertaking how we how we use it how we live and work in it and and the interactions we have with the public so that that's not a bad idea. Um, I, I, like you said, I wouldn't necessarily tie it up with this particular item, but no. But I'd, I'd like to bring it up because yeah. uh, we're talking now. We're starting to developing policies related to this, right? And I think you know we're going to be doing that. We're gonna that that, that is a step above and beyond. And uh, one of the things that uh, I would be willing to do, I'd, I'd volunteer my services for that. This is what I do for a living. Okay. Okay, and I'd be more than happy to volunteer my services to ensure that um, our staff understands their responsibility and their roles when it comes to um, active shooter, concealed carry, violations of 30.06, 30.07. I'd be more than happy to volunteer those services. The staff and the board. Yes. The staff and the board, correct. So just to touch on a few points, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, Eddie, uh, so we we discussed having signage. Now the signage has to be 
is it can only be present during a meeting in one of these two rooms. So these are going to be pedestal signs that we will move and remove based on our, our meetings. We, we really can't put permanent signs on our, our building entrance because we're not allowed to. The, the law prohibits us from prohibiting carry except in those isolated situations that we've discussed. So, to, I, you know, uh, I, it's really not addressed in this policy because this is really just the legal, uh, clarifying the legal uh, authority that we have within the use of our premises. Um, but I saw Robert wincing over there about, you know, gun, gun safes and storage lockers. Um, so I, I think the direction there to the staff would simply be once they see the signage, they're obligated to go back and, and put it back in their vehicle, correct? So administratively, I don't want to create a bailment. Uh, if someone turns their weapon to me and I'm responsible for safekeeping thereof and someone else were to get a hold of it or to discharge and it's in my locker or our locker as a fund facility or it tips over and discharges or anything, I'd, I'd rather not deal with that. I'd rather just send them back to their car and have them put it in an appropriate place. I, I've done a little research on this, Robert, and I will tell you, since we're going to have uh, portable signage, that the, where we place the signage is where the boundary begins. So if we place it at the front of the building, uh, that's, that's the boundary mark. Okay, so it's not necessarily only restricting them from the um, chambers. It, wherever we place that sign, that is where the boundary starts. So since they're portable. But, leg but legally, I'm, my understanding is we can't prohibit it in our building. Yes, you can on the day of meetings. On the Only day in those rooms. Uh, no, you can prohibit the whole entire building. So, so our resolution just does mention those two rooms because I think the law was mentioning this. I, I think there is a, a little bit of confusion, Representative Morgan, and we'll, I'll be glad to sit down with you sure. and go over that. But my interpretation of the law is a little bit more restrictive and so the signage would have to be at the entrance of the meeting rooms themselves, not at the entrance of the building containing the meeting rooms. Okay. Just like in here at City Hall, for example, the signage is here at the vestibule or lobby. Correct. As opposed to outside uh, of the building. So a person can legally carry on to inside the building, but once they come into our chambers, then they have to leave their, their weapons somewhere else. Okay. And the law is silent as far as the obligation of the person placing the sign is what the what the carrier does with their weapon. The, it's the carrier that's now obligated to retreat and go back and put it in this, their own safe location. Okay. Now, what about if you know somebody comes in and they have a meeting with? Uh, I'll bring up David. Okay, and you know, and you know, it, it's a meeting. It's not. It's not subject to the board meeting. Board meeting. Yeah. So, you know, how do I protect David? So we we briefly touched on, uh, uh, discuss, I briefly discussed it with Robert, and he's going to work on a staff policy. This, in a way, affects staff. The staff is handled under the employment procedures and policies. So um, there, there's an option that he's going he's gonna to look at as far as what he's going to recommend the policy is for the staff. Because I... I feel as a city employee, you know, I have a license to carry, yet in my own workplace, I'm not allowed to carry as a city employee, but all of my customers and every member of the public that I have to deal with is allowed to carry. So it is, it does, it does make you feel at a bit of a disadvantage, um, but that's the city's employment policy. So Robert would have the same ability with staff to recommend a, a, a policy that then we could uh, approve or disapprove. So, Eddie, looking at the recitals, the second recital just says men are clearly visible to the public. Are we suggesting for that sign that we're going to have a temporary sign that's only in use during board meetings and committees? The second one, however, or I'm sorry, the third recital says for 30.07 at the entrance to the property. So are we talking about putting that one up per permanently? Or is this where we're a little... It's, 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 a, tempor it's a temporary sign, correct, Eddie? This is where the where the meeting hall or meeting chambers is held, right? So I think what we're distinguishing though is on the open carry, we were recommending to prohibit that full time, and we have the ability to prohibit open carry, but we can't 
we don't have the ability to prohibit concealed unless it's in one of the open meeting act locations. Okay, so our 30.07 will be outside the building, no open carry in our building at any time. During meetings and committee meetings of the board, we will post the 30.06 temporary sign and as 07. needed. And, and 07. And 07. Okay. Well, the, the 07 will be outside the meeting, outside we'll, the building. Yeah, we'll just double dip. Okay. Thank so you. So basically, to summarize, open carry is prohibited all the time. Concealed carry is only prohibited by members of the public in, in when we have a meeting subject to the Open Meetings Act. Why didn't you just say that at the beginning? <laughs> it's a long and windy road. <laughs> we just need to... <laughs> That's what we're getting at. All right. Well, that's why we have these discussions, right? It's very important that we, 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 we take this seriously because um, there have been some issues lately and um, violence is on the rise. And once we isolate ourselves with the new facility, it's on us, guys. Right, we won't have security there. We're not going to have it. Actually, that's coming up. Okay. Yes. We got to To be continued. Yes. Okay, so do we have, uh, are there any more comments or discussion before we proceed to a motion? So, um, Mr. Miranda, you, you, do we uh, accept this like as it is with what you are gonna say you're gonna meet with, with uh, Representative Morgan or do we need to amend uh, the resolution? No, I don't, I don't think the resolution needs an amendment. I was gonna make the point directly to your question that that primarily the focus should be on open meetings uh, of the board or a subcommittee or a committee. It does not apply to one-on-one -on -one meetings with individual board members uh, and, and, or staff. Uh, the law was, does not allow us to prohibit open or concealed carry in those situations. Okay, so it does allow us to prohibit open, not but not totally the concealed. That's what we're adopting here. We're prohibiting open carry, period. period, but we're allowing concealed carry except where we have the authority to prohibit it. Which is going to be open to open. Oh, open meetings, I'm sorry. I thought you meant open carry. <laughs> okay. You, Mr. Representative Morgan, are you, are you happy with that resolution? I'm very satisfied with the resolution because the resolution, it's, uh, it covers everything in its totality. Um, it addresses um, concealed carry 30.06. It uh, addresses uh, open carry 30.07, which is very important. A lot of folks, a lot of, a lot of establishments are very quick to put up a 30.06 and they forget about open carry. It's a new uh, law of the land right. here in the state of Texas. So they'll put up the 30.06 thinking it covers everything. So this resolution actually um, covers us for all aspects of carry, legal carry in the state of Texas. I feel good about it. About it. I make a motion that we accept the resolution as written uh, as, uh, and supported by Representative Morgan and Representative, I mean, um, Mr. Miranda. Um, and, yeah. Okay. So I, I make that recommendation. So we have a motion to accept the resolution made by Mario, seconded by Sam. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Item. Item 14, discussion and action regarding approval of an amended be amendment between the trust and the pension technology group to clarify contract obligations and include the integration of PeopleSoft. Robert Ash, Pension Administrator, before you today is a proposed First Amendment to the, our agreement with PTG, who is putting in the pension administration system. Uh, a couple months back, the board authorized the implementation and conversion with PeopleSoft, and we're working on that now. But it was never fully amended in the contract itself. So this is going to integrate that PeopleSoft authorization that you previously provided, and you agreed that we would pay $33,000 to first convert with PeopleSoft and then to ADP. Our original agreement with PTG was to implement with ADP. Uh, ADP is taking a little longer than what we expected. And so we went back to people's, I mean, PTG and asked them, you know, what, what is going to happen due to this delay? Uh, what are your ideas? And we talked about it, uh, consulted our 
Compliance Council and drafted this amendment, which basically says we're going to include the PeopleSoft implementation. Once that comes online, it's con fully converted and accepted, and we'll start paying maintenance fees on the system, at which time 30 days after that, we will pay back the holdback, which we're holding pending completion of the implementation. If you'll remember, our agreement basically had six payments of $75,000 or $450,000 total with a holdback of about $400,000. And so the only thing that was left on the table was ADP. How much are they going to charge us to implement with ADP now since they've already implemented with PeopleSoft? Or what happens if ADP never gets implemented for one reason or another? And it was uh, decided in, in discussions that They've done about 90% of the work. 10% is still outstanding to be done with ADP. And therefore, uh, we've reduced the amount that we pay by about $88,000. And if and when ADP gets converted, then we'll be responsible for that payment. By virtue of this document and this amendment, they've agreed not to charge us more than that. And so uh, we still are protected if it takes longer than they anticipated. Uh, they're still limited to the 10%. So this is what the amendment basically provides. It's been uh, settled between the parties subject to your approval and agreement, and it's been reviewed by our Compliance Council. We're glad to answer any questions. Uh, is there any expiration or time limit on when we might ask them to help with ADP? I mean, we're obviously not gonna go back to them in 10 years and say, hey, by the way, the city's, you know, converting with ADP, you owe us. Well, is there anything related to that in the agreement? No, uh, because we don't have a good handle on when ADP may happen. I think we'd have to just go on a reasonable time. Uh, if after a reasonable time, which I would assume would be a year or two, then certainly we'd probably say that that's going to be a separate. And you'd agreement. bring back an amendment to basically close out the, the agreement? Well, we didn't have to do anything. We just won't pay the 88000 Okay. So... Okay, and I just wanted to give kudos to Robert for being heads up on this, not only in putting together the contract amendment, which really um, was a little murky on, on the, the process, but also on, on working with PTG to interface with PeopleSoft, which had been giving us problems with our existing system for years. So this is an excellent um, cost-effective and, and staff efficiency. Um, and, and it'll get us through to if and when the city ever gets solidified with ADP. Okay, so we have a motion to uh, accept. I, I, yes. Let me have a, uh, have a question. Uh, will, when converting into PTG or ADP, will it delay uh, the, retirement, the retirees receiving their, their monthly pension? Robert Ash, Pension Administrator. No, the idea is that we're converting to PeopleSoft now, mm -hmm. and so we're implementing the conversion based on the existing computer system. When ADP gets converted, then PTG will interface with ADP, and there should be no delay or issues with the retiree payments. Hopefully it'll be tested thoroughly before it, it actually goes live and that'll, that'll be a chore for us to do, and PTG. Uh, we just don't know when that'll happen. IT has briefed us in the past to say the project is not considered complete with ADP until it interfaces with each of the various mm -hmm. uh, dozen different modules it has to interface with, so they wouldn't be able to go live with that transition until that, that interface works. But we already got the briefing today that PeopleSoft and PTG is in its it's in its testing phase, right? No, right. Okay. I'm just more concerned about you know, the retirees. Right. So, know. on the PeopleSoft side, we're testing that retiree payroll now. We're in our second of three tests uh, for three different parallel runs, if you will. When we convert to ADP, I would expect the same amount of testing, uh, roughly. And of course, that'll be a call by the city and us collectively. But I would expect. I would expect it to be significant testing before that happens, and I wouldn't anticipate a delay in the retirees getting paid no matter what. And what about the new new retirees? You know, like say people applying for retirement benefits this month, 
you know, will it, you know, will it interfere or hurt them? You no, know? it should not interfere. Um, right now, we interface with PeopleSoft as it is. Uh, we're just using a separate mechanism to get a back feed based on retiree payroll that's that's made. We continue to provide the same interface. Going to ADP, they're testing the interface now. I don't know what that final interface will look like at this point, and I don't know what the back feed will look like. Yeah, well, yeah, like, still out like right now, the process is they make an application, and you know, this is, and they can anticipate more or less about a month, at, you know, till the next board meeting is approved. You know, their their uh, their application. And then, then they start receiving their their pension benefits at the end of that. I, I that expect month. the same timing will take place. Okay, I'm just, that's what I'm concerned about. Understood. So yeah, the scope of this item right here is just to amend the contract we have to to be clear. So we're just we're just trying to recognize the recommendations Roberts made to work within the scope of the contract we have with PTG. Not really to get too much into the the inner workings of it. But Pressy. How much? Robert, how much money are we paying at PTG? Um, just went over that. Uh, we paid them. You want the total amount, or is that those are the numbers you just went over, right? Correct. Okay. Then, then, uh, and I don't know if this is something for the future, but police and fire also use use uh, PTG, and, and uh, maybe in the future we could look to maybe try to uh, um, use um, both organizations to try to bring uh, down. So I, I think that's a good idea. <coughs> I know that their system has some added uh, bells and whistles that ours don't. Uh, I think they have a scanning as well as self-service. Well, we didn't sign up for that at this point, and so our fees and our costs were less. Uh, it may be something that we want to consider in the future, and we need to work with our auditors to make sure the self-service would work and meet their you know, concerns. And then on the scanning, um, you know, we'd have to see how that integrates into the system. Because we're under such a time, short time period to get it implemented, remember this was supposed to be implemented by the end of last year. That's when we thought ADP was going to go live. We only had six months to get this done. And so we didn't think that we even had the luxury of considering these other items. But we'll bring that forward to you if and when it seems feasible. Okay, so we have a motion to accept the uh, the amendment made by Nick. Do we have a second? Second, second by Robert. Uh, Pressy. Aye. Uh, Mario. Aye. Robert. Aye. Sam. Aye. Nick. Aye. And Rebecca. Aye. Okay, motion passes. <laughs> Item 15: Discussion and action regarding the receipt of an investment manager report from Allianz. Taylor Carrington and Jeff Sharan from Alliance Reporting. Um, thank you all for your time this morning. As I mentioned, I'm Taylor Carrington. I lead the institutional business for Allianz Global Investors here in uh, Texas in the Midwest. Joining me is Jeff Sharon, who is the Senior Product Specialist for the Structured Alpha Investment Team, and uh, Jeff is our primary point of contact for the investment team to our institutional clients uh, around the United States. He's worked with the Structured Alpha team since its inception back in 2005. Just as a reminder of the strategy that you are invested in, um, it's called the Structured Alpha 1000 Plus strategy. Um, the objective of the portfolio is to generate a return of 10% over the return of uh, T-bills, net of fees, on an annual basis. Um, we use the options market in order to do that, and we are unique in the um, structure here in that this is an absolute return-oriented portfolio. We are seeking to generate this return regardless of what's going on in the stock market or the bond market or broader markets in general. Uh, also, in order to be aligned with our clients, we have an interesting fee schedule where you pay zero management fee. You only uh, incur a fee when we generate a return over and above that benchmark. Um, after 2016 and 2017, which were fairly easy years in the market where we generated return that was about in line with the target uh, for your portfolio, 
as you know, February brought some volatility in the market, and our uh, returns for the month of February were negative. But on a year-to-date basis, at this point, we're now ahead um, at 1% approximate return, which is over that of the benchmark. It's back in positive territory. And after a very difficult February, I think the team did a nice job at managing um, the volatility in the market and getting the performance rebound that we would expect. So as you look at that period from February to May, it played out uh, exactly as we would have expected and we're back positive on a year-to-date basis. Uh, but during that time frame, the um, fund incurred no management fee from our team because we were uh, underperforming during that time frame. And so again, we're aligned with you in the lack of performance equals a lack of fees for us. And performance, which we've now rebound, is uh, you know back where we can incur a fee going forward. Um, in terms of the portfolio and the team, there's been um, good stability with the team. The platform has continued to grow. We've added analysts on the team as the platform has grown, and um, things are m- moving smoothly and, and swiftly with the uh, structured alpha team in the market. Jeff can talk a little bit about the uh, performance of February through May and how that pattern plays out because I think that's an important thing for you to understand in case we do incur a period like that again in the future. And um, I'll let him kind of give some thoughts and address some questions on that. Great, thanks Taylor. Uh, Good morning everyone. So yes, uh, typically when uh, we have an environment where things are very smooth in the markets and we build a portfolio in a very smooth environment and then we have a very abrupt and severe change to a very difficult uh, market disruption, which is exactly what happened in early February, there's a transition period. And this transition period tends to take a few months. Uh, Typically, we say four months because we we use options, and options have an expiration date. And the typical expiration date is about two months out. So let us go through two rotations of the portfolio. And after four months, we should be positive, period. No excuses. Doesn't matter if the market continues down or if it goes back up, no excuses, Uh, but it can take that long for the process to play out. So in this case, we went through February, we, we, uh, the first order of business is to control risk, protect the portfolio, move some positions out of harm's way at a cost, and then, uh, you know, the recovery can kick in over the ensuing couple of months, and that's exactly what played out. So we're very pleased that at, uh, here we are in mid-June and, and uh, the portfolio is performing. We're outperforming our, our hurdle rate, and that's good. Uh, the bad news is that we're behind schedule. Uh, so in the second half of the year, uh, we're going to implement our process in, in the normal course of business. We're going to take what the market gives us. We're not going to increase our risk profile just to try and reach and get you to that 10% target. If we, do, if we perform you know, positive on your behalf, but below 10%, so be it. We're gonna preserve the risk profile. And as Taylor mentioned, you know, the way our fee schedule works, it's only a performance fee, so you're only gonna pay a fee on what we deliver to you. If we deliver less, you pay less. That's, it's just that simple. As a reminder, there was no fee charged in the first quarter. In the second quarter, you would pay a small fee because there was a small amount of outperformance. And then if things were to be- proceed normally uh, in the second half of the year, uh, you would you know, wind up with a fee that's roughly half what one would expect to pay over the course of a year because the outperformance delivered would be roughly half. We might get you to 5 or 6% over T-bills, net of fees, uh, at the end of the year. So that's how that works. Uh, with respect to a market forecast, um, the second half, uh, what we're able to deliver is going to be a function of uh, how, what the generalized level of market volatility or fear is in the market. Right now it's quite low again, kind of where we were last year and heading into February, we're back low. Uh, so you would expect sort of a normal uh, level of performance. Uh, the key driver for us is what is the volatility environment in which we build the portfolio? So when volatility goes up, that, that's not necessarily good for us in the short term, but if we can build the portfolio in a high volatility environment to begin with, we're much more resilient. So that's a, that's a good thing. We'll see if we get that. But if we don't, you know, we showed last year and in past environments that we can perform quite well even when volatility is low. Um, and then, you know, just as a reminder, the philosophy of this strategy is we play the hand that we're dealt. We don't know the environment that lies ahead very few people do, uh, but that's not the point. The point is 
whatever market conditions come our way. It's our problem, not your problem. It's our problem to navigate it, and you know we're accountable to that. So uh, we look forward to doing a good job for you in the second half. And uh, at this point, I'd, I'd throw it out for any questions. One, one question. Um, we, we said that it's performance-based. Yes. 10% uh, is the, the mark on the wall that we're reaching for. Yes. Uh, can you explain to me how the fees work when it's below 10%? Sure. So the, uh, the hurdle rate when the performance fee kicks in is the return of T-bills, which is now running at around almost 2%. So obviously, T-bill, we give you the T-bill rate for free, as we should. Uh, but that's, you know, that's the alternative. That's if you didn't invest with us, you could put it in that and you can get that. Great. So that's the hurdle rate. The expectation is that we're going to perform north of 10% and that after fees, you will end up with 10%. That, and, and the meter starts running after the T-bill rate is achieved. So, um, you know, the 10% the is not the hurdle, the T-bill rate is the hurdle, but the expectation, the expected return after a year has passed is that net of everything, you should wind up at around 10%, and that has been the experience. Okay. So your fees kick in after you've, you've hit the hurdle? Yes. Okay. Which is generally two, two and a half. Uh, right, right. It's been closer to zero in the past number of years. <laughs> but when we first launched, it was four and a half. And so it's, you know, it's always a moving target. But, um, but the idea is that we take all of the notional invested capital and put it into T-bills, physically into T-bills. So that, er that earns that rate, and that, that's a starting point. That's our starting point. Gotcha. So. Makes sense. Thank you. But so I, think, I think the key, I'm sorry to interrupt, uh, the key, I think the key is if we were to generate no excess return for you in the course of a year, we work for free until, you know, there's a high watermark. So we work for free until we get you back. We were underwater. We were, our return was below that of T-bills in the first quarter. So not only do we not charge a fee, but we have to recover that deficiency uh, in the second quarter or as long, however, long, however long it takes. And we've done that now, but if we hadn't, we just work for free until we do. Okay. Um, you have mouths to feed. How long could you sustain going without a fee, and would you adjust your risk profile? Because I heard you say you wouldn't adjust your risk profile, but at what point would you consider adjusting it if you've not been able to reach target and hit it? Have you had what's the longest period, I guess, since inception of the fund, which was 2005? Yes. Have you gone without, without meeting your target? Great. To answer your second question, first three quarters. After 2008, we had a drawdown, and we had to recover from that, and we worked for free until uh, as long as it took. Um, yes, we have mouths to feed, but we do have a diversified business mix. We have some flat fee revenue and some other vehicles overseas and in different channels, uh, and we also have, not to get too technical, but we in the investment management business, it's common to have mandatory deferrals. So we have... <laughs> some competition three years ago, every year, from three years okay. prior that carries forward, which we don't love it at point zero, <laughs> but three years later, it's right. actually quite handy. So, right. and that's important to us because we never want to be in a position where we, there's a conflict. There's, so there's never any conflict of interest because of that. And first and foremost, we preserve our risk profile. We don't reach, and we do have the backing of a large firm. And that's the whole point, that's why it's a good blend to have this type of a, of a structure inside of a large financial services organization. So there, there isn't any conflict of interest ever on that. That's great to hear. We had a manager in here not long ago that was talking about how they're getting clients that are pushing them to get a little more aggressive to try and chase returns. And it just made me a little nervous and I'm glad to hear you guys have some, some structure in place to avoid having to worry about yeah, that. Yeah, thank you. And in fact, the product you're in didn't exist originally. We had a 5% target. And some clients wanted us more, to give them more, right? It's America. Everybody wants more. Mm -hmm. so, um, so, but we didn't alter that risk profile. We right. just launched a different product, and then people could choose for themselves. But within the fund that you're in, it will stay true to those objectives. Please. On your portfolio holdings on page 17, I think you have $896 million of which... Around 30 million is in the puts and calls. Am I reading that right? Okay, so. You have uh, a treasury bills, 870 million in treasury bills. That's Can right. Can you kind of, is that a normal 
distribution, how that is. Can you explain that to me? Well, it's normal in the sense that the way options work is when you buy an option, you pay you pay a premium for the option, just like right. an insurance policy, for example. Uh, when you sell an option, you receive premium. Right. And so the long and the short, you know, the ones you buy and the ones you sell tend to cancel out. But when you sell an option, you have to post collateral margin for it. So what we do is we put all of the investment into T-bills. So that's going to represent the, generally speaking, T-bills and cash represent the assets of the fund. Then the, the options we buy and the options we sell net out to a pretty small amount. And the nice thing about selling options is you receive premium, but that premium is not yours to keep until that option expires. So you have to have cash in place for that. So yes, this is quite typical. And what you're seeing is a netting of the of the long and the short positions. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Prissy. So um, this is this is a def defensive move that that uh, we're taking here, and so uh, we discussed this at investment committee yesterday. Uh, uh, we forgot I forgot to ask you, uh, how many other municipalities do you have that uh, that uh, that you work with? Uh, roughly 20. 20? Yeah. And, and one of our biggest concerns is I think we have about 15% of the whole portfolio in, in absolute return. Do you have any other clients that have uh, percentages that, as high as that? We do. Yeah. We have clients uh, that run the gamut from 1% up to, as in some levels, you know, much higher than where you are now. Okay. Um, the other thing is um, I would encourage you to think about our platform across all the funds we manage because we do manage them as a pro rata allocation. When we place a trade, we pro rata allocate it across all the different funds. The different funds are just different risk return combinations of the same exact process. So really the denominator, when you think about what percentage you are of our total business, you know, our total business is 11.5 billion, not eight or 900 million in the fund. And then as for your allocation, it's quite in line with what other municipalities are doing. Okay. Thank you. Jeff, uh, I had a question. Uh, yes. It, it seems like options are expensive vehicles to in of themselves. And I would assume that there's a significant amount of your administrative costs in, in providing this management to us. What, what is your overhead for just investing costs and those type of things? Yes, so everything we do from an investment operation perspective is net. So every return we show you, every target we have is all net of all bid-ask spreads, commission costs, all of that. So if we're going to get 10%, let me just phrase it a different way. Yes. And you were going to spend 100 to 200 basis points on option costs. It would just be lower to implement than that. Them. What, what is yeah. that amount? Because that, then you've got to gross more than 10 or 12 to get us to 10. So. Yeah, understood. So the fee is the big, bigger part of that, right? That's, that's, a, that's just straight math. We have a 30%, it's a zero 30 fee structure. The bid ask spread and commission costs typically, it varies depending on trading activity, restructuring costs, maybe 40 or 50 basis points, maybe a little more in extreme environments. But again, we don't even think about that because when we put on the trade, the trade has to have its uh, the desired profit loss profile net of all that to begin with. But yes, it's a, it's not necessarily an explicit cost. It is an implicit cost that's already accounted for and it's in about that amount. So if we're going to have a target of 10% yes, and treasuries are 2%. Yes. So you're going to hit 12% to get the 10, right? Cause it's 10% above treasuries. And then you've got administrative expenses on top of that. Are you looking at, 13%, 14% gross, is that? That's right. 14% okay. over T-bills is about right. Um, the, there are some administrative costs for the fund itself. These amount to typically 15 basis points or less, sometimes single digit for the actual fund operating expenses. But for the investment pers uh, perspective, yeah, about 14%. Okay, thank you. And this is still a relatively young fund. Uh, your inception was December oh, 2015. Sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, is that correct? Well, yes, but uh, the the fund the, this vehicle was launched in. I'm sorry. Go ahead. This is the client. This is the client performance. Oh, the client performance. That's right. Yes. So, December of 15 is when you all funded. Okay. Not okay. So, how old is the actual vehicle? The vehicle goes back to 2011, okay. and the strategy 
w which this is operated in complete accordance with, it goes back to 2005. Okay. And have you have you hit that that 14 percent during that time, or we have? Okay. Uh, actually, I mean, our original vehicle targeted five net, so it'd be, everything was linear. It'd be half that, and we've accomplished that over over 13 years. Well, it's not on here. The calendar year return in 2016 was slightly above 10 percent. The calendar year return in 17 was slightly below 10 percent, like a nine and a half ish. And then the um, inception annualized performance is below target, but still a solid number. And and to remind the board that this is. This this uh, investment allocation we have here is designed to have less volatility than equities and and better returns than than fixed. So it's did I characterize that right, Robert? Um, so again, as we're getting anything over over what uh, Treasuries would be is is uh, is definitely an advantage to the fund. It's not going to give us probably exactly what an equity would, but it's got less risk. So. Okay, any other comments or questions? All righty, thank you for your report. Thank you all. We'll see you again. Thank you all. Item 16, discussion and action regarding the report from Kellen Associates. Alex Browning from Kellen Reporting. Morning, everyone. Uh, so today I have two items. Uh, the first is the May performance report, and then just an update on some education provision for the board members and what we're doing to work with staff on that. So on this first page, we have the actual asset allocation of the fund. You can see that roughly half of it is in equity among domestic equity, international equity, and private equity, and then round it out with other asset classes. An absolute return here is at 16%, but your target's 15. We can see the differences between the actual in this third column versus the target and the percent difference. And what you'll see is, is that the deviation from target is very small. So in terms of the staff rebalancing in a timely manner, uh, they're doing their job and the risk profile of the fund is very close to the targeted asset allocation. We have the individual managers and the composites and the dollar differences between the prior month, April, and today, May. What you'll see at the very bottom is that you started or you ended April with 795 million. There were investment returns of 4.4 million, distributions of around 1.1 million, and so net growth ending the month of May at 798 million. On this next page, we have performance. And at the composite level, domestic equity was just slightly below its benchmark by 17 basis points, or 0.17%, so fairly close. International equity, while negative, and returning negative 1.78% was above its benchmark by 34 basis points. Private equity, as well as private real estate, does not provide returns on a monthly basis. And this will come in at the total fund calculation as well. Uh, so at the next quarterly meeting, we will see the returns for private equity and private real estate. Um, and that's just because of the fact that in those private markets, it's valuation based. and so. There's a process by which they have to make sure that their marks on their individual holdings are accurate and accounted for. In fixed income, the return was negative 48 basis points versus the benchmark of 0.71. The vast majority of this underperformance came from the exposure to the Franklin Templeton Global uh, Plus, which is a global fixed income portfolio. So it's US, non-US, in emerging markets and what happened during this period, as we also saw reflected in the international equity performances, is that one, currencies moved against us, as well as the credit-oriented 
positions or corporate debt outside the U.S. was hurt during this period. Real estate, a 0% return because we don't have returns on a monthly basis. And then we have MLPs. And of course, as we all know, if we look at this uh, five-year number, three-year number, excuse me, uh, of negative 7.26%, MLPs have been tough sledding, that's for sure. Um, you know, they are correlated to energy markets, the way that they contract with uh, the folks who are using their services. But if you look at this last month with rising oil prices, they've been able to impute that into the contracts moving forward, and profitability has expanded through the industry. So a 7.34% uh, return for a month is a nice addition to the total return of the portfolio. I think that might be the, the, the most salience ever outperformed the benchmark since we've had them. Well, I think they've outperformed the benchmark. Not by that much. Yeah. The, their three years, we've had them, and they've outperformed the benchmark by 1.17%, 117 basis points. The benchmark, however, is in the tank. So the asset class has... Been right. Well, yeah, I'm just saying the, the, one, the 156, I think, is, is more than we've ever seen them outperform. Oh, probably in a month. It's yeah. also the biggest return I think we've seen in period. a while. <laughs> period, yeah. yeah. And, you know, you may recall from when the manager was here that... This is a market that is heavily influenced by individual Joe and Janes out there in the market. About 80% of that uh, market is retail investors. And so when bad news comes out or if there's extra volatility, a drawdown in that market, the retail investors really shoot for the exit. And that actually gives your managers a little bit more of an opportunity because as an institutional investor, you rebalance consistently whereas the retail investor gets scared and goes to cash and then waits for everything to go up to buy high, just then to sell low and buy high again. Um, only if you're trying to save money. Um, the absolute return managers uh, together had a negative 6.68% return for uh, the month. Um, it's mixed where Allianz added value uh, AQR detracted and Invesco uh, a slight detraction as well. Um, you know, you'll recall that they are to be low, have a low correlation with markets. Um, we expect that they're going to move somewhat independently and sometimes they're going to be negative. Uh, and I just, you know, what the role of alternatives broadly should be that when there's a downturn in the market, they should help you recover value more quickly than your growth-oriented investments like private equity and public equities. Uh, but there will be times at which they will all fall together. It's just that their correlation benefit, net of fees, should help you recover value quicker. Would, um, kind of off topic, but it, it, would there be a way on, on, on the report to maybe um, indicate the ones that are on watch, maybe italics or a highlight or something? I, w I was, but she didn't see me. So we've discussed that, uh, adding a, <laughs> sorry. So you're, you're planning on that, I guess? Okay. We're going to add a footnote. Okay. Sounds good. So the good news, though, is, is that the total fund had a positive return of 53 basis points, and that uh, translated roughly into $4.4 million for the month, so uh, a decent return. So we're at 5 5.46 for the year. Yep. Uh, Alex, uh, on, that, on that number for the month, though, um, it's reflecting that 16% of our assets did not perform. That's real estate and private equity. Is that correct? We're, we're using zeros there. Yes. And so... Um, and that's not really a, a, a true number then for the month. No, it isn't. And thank you for reminding me of that. So if you were to account for the fact that private equity and private real estate uh, have no performance for the month because of the fact that they don't submit performance numbers uh, on a monthly basis. If you took their benchmark returns out of the total uh, blended index, that instead of being, and you can see it, excuse me, right here at 1.08, okay, that 1.08 would actually be closer to uh, 73 basis points, so the amount of underperformance for the month would be closer to 20 basis points. And so we're talking about 
uh, underperformance relative to the strategic blended benchmark for the month. And so I, I guess so we're taking a 30 we, basis we points hit. Right. More or less. 20. 20, 20 basis points hit. Yeah. For the month, but for, for the, month. the fiscal year, the same thing is true. We're, not, we're missing their data yes, in that exactly. as well. And so, um, you know, we, and I talked with a performance analyst about fixing this, so, you know, how could we actually reflect on an apples-to-apples -apples basis and, you know, me being sort of a Luddite, I was just like, well, let's just take it out. I said, well, then, you know, the historical returns in the database get mucked up and then, you know, it introduces a lot of error that would be hard to tease out and make sure that we got it right, but on a quarterly basis, that relative comparison will be correct. Would it would it not be a simple disclosure to have a, just the way you're doing it now and then adjusted value that would show what hasn't been reported? Footnote or something. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking another footnote. We only have four well, not so far. We're adding five. Not necessarily six. a footnote, but just in parentheses, you would know that that was adjusted for whatever hadn't been reported. Um, I don't know if that's too much to ask or not, but it's it, it, it's it nice to know sure. for comparison's sake. No, it, it, in my mind, I thought it wasn't too much to ask, but when I talked to the data people, they were like, oh my gosh, you know. Yeah, more numbers. Would fall apart. Um, I mean, you know, and, and so I just did this by hand. Uh, you know, that 73 basis point is an estimate, really, because I'm not accounting for all the cash flows. I'm just taking the weights at the beginning of the performance period and then using that to calculate pulling out the private equity and the real estate benchmarks. So... Robert, when we when we evaluate our our 7.5 discount rate for each year, based on what hasn't been reported, is that really an accurate um, evaluation of whether we've met our hurdle or not? So the the final valuation will have final numbers. Okay. So our fiscal year ends in August. Our auditors and our actuaries use final numbers, so they don't start working until October. Generally, September, uh, they went August close through the custodial bank, and then they confirm numbers with our investment managers. And so we have audited <coughs> numbers by all these returns during the year. They'll reach out to Callan on occasion, make sure that the numbers that they're looking at appear right to them as well. And so for, for those purposes, I, I think they're real. So at least once a year we have the bona fide Sure. Okay. And, and I think you have updated numbers on a quarterly basis. Right. Um, my question to, to Callum would be, why not just put the index returns and then true up after that? If, if that's the, the bogey, then why not just put the index returns? And then when you get the quarterly return, then true up at that point. And that, that would be a, another solution. Um, I think I proposed that and got beaten back a little bit, but I'll try it again um, because that makes sense. And then, you know, it's... Uh, because if they put a zero, why can't they put the index? So let me try that again. All right, because right now it looks like we've underperformed, but we don't know how two of our asset classes are doing. So we're yeah. misrepresenting. And yeah, that's 16% of our portfolio. Right. On their side, I think they don't want to represent, misrepresent. Let's put a footnote. <laughs> but, <laughs> but if... <laughs> but if the... My only suggestion is if the index is the target that we're being measured against, then we don't know how much or below that is, but we would assume that our managers over time would exceed the index because that's why they're they're hired. And so uh, but over time yeah. I think you know it, it's it it bears some greater you know work and so we'll look at it and see if we can figure out a way that represents it uh, a bit more intuitively um, and doesn't lead to someone thinking that the uh, underperformance relative to the strategic blended index is accurate on a monthly basis and the most should be off is two months before it trues up and so with that that's uh, that concludes my remarks on fund performance uh, I can move on just to the education topic, unless there are any questions. Okay. So um, I guess as you probably all well know as board members, the Texas Pension Review Board 
has education requirements for each of the board members. Uh, in your first year, there's a requirement for um, seven hours of training in core topics. And then for those returning, every two years, there's a requirement to complete four hours of either core or non-core topics. Um, Robert has let me know that you can do some of this education training online. Uh, but to help out in this and also because we are uh, contracted to provide an hour of education per year to the board, we are working with the Texas Pension Review Board to get all of our courses accredited to be able to account for that credit. Um, additionally, for those folks who uh, want to just get it all done and you know do it in a way that they won't be um, pulled away by their jobs or emails, et cetera, we do put on Calen Colleges where we provide these topics and this education in a format in various places across the U.S. The next Callan College is in San Francisco, and that is July 24th and 25th for one and a half days. So for those folks who are new, assuming that all of our coursework is accredited, again, we're working with the Texas Pension Review Board to get it accredited, you could do it all in one day. Um, and so right now, that's what we're working on. And we hope to have final news on that accreditation shortly. And then if so, and anybody's interested, we can provide the agenda to Robert. He can distribute it to the board members uh, for the purposes of education under the requirements of the Texas Pension Review Board. OK. Thank you for that. Sure. It'd be very helpful. Okay, any other questions or comments? All righty. Thank you. Thank you. Have a safe flight home. Okay. Item 17, discussion and action regarding the report from the pension administrator. Robert Ash, pension administrator. Piggybacking on item 13, the chair has directed the staff to do a little bit of research on security guards at the new office uh, during our board meetings and maybe prior to. And we reached out and the El Paso Police Department can be hired for $30 an hour. And we'll have one person there. The $120 for a meeting if we use them for four hours. $1,440 a year. And I'll put that in next year's operating budget um, if, if we want to proceed in that manner. And if you have concerns, please, please let us know. But we'd have one armed police officer in spite of our signs that say uh, <laughs> to provide increased security during the times of our board meetings. No other time, just during the time of our board meeting. <laughs> Two kolaches and a donut, how about that? Two kolaches and a donut? It won't work, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, that's our current thinking uh, as far as security uh, for board meeting days during times when the board meeting's taking place, hiring some from 8 to 12 uh, on our board meeting days. On a contractual basis. That's up to you. I mean, that's. So the advantage of going with. The advantage of going with the peace. We have a peace officer. It's it's a you know it's El Paso Police Department. We are a city entity, so it it, it does make sense to partner with with our own organization when we can. Um, being out on our own, we need to have some form of security. I, I would think um, if, if for whatever reason we have a, a situation that, that needs it, having that peace officer is better. Most security, they're going to have to go ahead and call a peace officer and we're paying them anyway. So my personal opinion is if we're paying for security, I'd, I'd rather go to to uh to an off-duty police officer they have this service they they market themselves very much like a security service so it's uh you know we certainly could get yeah i guess you're getting the most bang for your buck when you when you go with a peace officer as opposed to just a private security so well you were just mentioning yeah, about training for yes, for that, that so but that doesn't it, 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 you know, it didn't say that you needed uh, a police officer. It's just training on what you know what actions to take in terms of uh, active shooter. It doesn't you know it doesn't require a, a police officer. So I, I think 
some of the staff's concerns in the past have been uh, you handle different types of claims. Some of them are disability claimants. Um, don't typically get large people in the audience, but it can happen. Um, and if you have someone that uh, comes in from the public and we don't know about their uh, mental whereabouts and if they have some sentimentalities uh, with regards to the staff or otherwise, it doesn't hurt to have a little extra protection there. And uh, I think it's a comfort feeling more than anything else. By the time you call the police uh, and get them there, sometimes things are over. And so it's a preventative thing if you feel you need it. it but it's certainly a decision of the boards. I think it's a good obligation as a public entity that we provide that security for our visitors and for ourselves for four hours once a month. I don't think is, is really a, a significant impediment to our fund. Um, well, that's not the issue. The issue is why? Why do you need one? I mean, I don't think that we deal with, uh, with, with issues that much, or I've, as long as I've been on the board, I've never seen anyone uh, get upset or, you know, uh, have to deal with. You know. So really, this is within Robert's purview in his budget that he's, he's, re he's putting $1,400 into his budget. I, I don't really think it's something unless, unless the board has serious reservations, we just let Robert as the administrator handle this because it's something that he would like to have for the, for our meetings. So it's really a budgetary issue. If, if, if we want to get into the inner workings of a policy that that's another thing, but he's, he's just letting us know today he's putting it in the budget. So if there's any serious opposition to having $1,400 in the budget that the administrator is requesting, then sure, I, you can I take it out of the budget. Right. And I, I don't, I, I think paying $1,400 to have a, a secure meeting once a month is not a lot to ask for. If I could ask Nick, what would you guys do with the public service work? Uh, Paso Water has a security service they've had it for like you know, 30 years. And, and they're usually staffing full-time as the building security? They're full-time. Yeah. So the advantage of the police department is you don't, you don't have to have a formal contract with them. They're, they're independent contractors, so they're on a rotation, and you just get somebody who's available for four hours when you need them, and you pay them $30 an hour. So it's, and, it's a pretty simple setup. And we're only asking for this because we're out on our own in our own building. If not, if we if it was here like we normally would yeah, be, we wouldn't be asking for it. But since we're going out to our own building, then you know we we require some kind of security. Yes. And I don't I don't feel that fourteen hundred dollars is a whole lot of money to for. Hey, Pressy, for do they uh, at, uh, police and fire? Do they have uh, private security? Yeah, they have police. Wire. They have police officers on the board. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I think leaning forward in. Um, I think leaning forward is is a good idea. Um, we will be on our own over there, and from from the perspective of um, the security being a police officer, it really cuts down on a lot of the a um, lot of other issues if we had any uh, that because that person is a trained law enforcement officer. So um, I feel very comfortable with this. I guess we'll be look, looking at that new budget, and, and um, I guess one of my concerns is that we're going into a, our own building. We're on our own. We're going to have expenses that we've not had in the past. And, and um, we, I don't even know if we've even looked at that yet, uh, what additional expenses. Here's an, another additional expense. So I'm just worried. I mean, it's a great idea that we have our own building, but how much more is it going to cost us and continue to add? I mean, I'm not sure if it's a good idea or not. I'm going to think about it, but I'm just saying we got to be careful with all the expenses. It's not our money. It's, 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 the, uh, it's the retirees and the employees' money. Sure. Right, we built some of those expenses in this year's fiscal budget, so we've outlined some of them, probably not all of them, until we get into the our own building. But, uh, I mean, we did bake some of that into the budget because we thought we'd be in a little earlier than we're probably going to be in. And so it was in this year's budget as well. And I, last thing I'll say, I've been on this board for 17 years. Uh, and and um, some, of, some of you went, what? And I've, I've never, we've never seen an issue in all these years. Uh, 
anything to do with the, the Well, and I agree. I just, I don't think you don't have safety measures because you've never had an right. incident. Have we ever had a fire? Pardon me? Have we ever had a fire in this building? We should probably just get rid of the smoke alarm. I, I'd like to hear Mr. Ortega's comments. I'm sorry. I think you were interrupted. Uh, no, it's pretty much done. I'm, I'm just, uh, I, I'm just not too sure about it. I think we, we need to discuss it more as a board, or maybe we need to have a policy uh, um, in regards to that. Uh, I mean, I just, I have mixed feelings. I, in a way, I think, I think it's a good thing, but uh, I'm not sure. That's fine. Um, newsletter will be coming out. We're going to call it Compass Points. Compass Points. Um, just like our logo has a compass in it, we're changing the letter from pension matters to compass points. Uh, this will be the last one where we send one out to every retiree in the newsletter. We'll have a, a notice that says future newsletters go online or call our office and we'll send you one type thing. Uh, but this will be going out relatively soon. Uh, Texpers is having a training in October. It's October 18th. And this is the basic trustee training. It'll be held in Austin. And if you're interested in going, if you'll contact David Garcia in our office, um, I'll certainly give you the particulars on that, or you can look online. Texpers is also having their summer education session. It'll be August 12th through the 14th. That one's in San Antonio. That won't have the basic uh, trustee training. It'll have the advanced training. Uh, two different training topics or outlines at that point. Two different conferences, uh, both co-sponsored by Texpers. The uh, guidelines for the funding principles offered by the State Pension Review Board were approved when the State Pension Review Board met on the 14th of June. This is, as you will recall, a guideline that's being developed by the State Pension Review Board to assist or provide guidance for plan sponsors and pension funds on how to have a properly funded and properly designed plan. It's advisory. It's not required. There's no legislation attached to this. We supplied comments and then during the notice and comment period, uh, very few comments were accepted. None of ours were accepted, uh, but it did pass by them. This is the second inroad they've made um, regarding guidelines. And so uh, they're out there now is what it, what it amounts to. Again, they're just advisory and used for guidance no required mandate for these guidelines but noting that there were many people that responded but they could turn into that if the state legislature looks at this as the authoritative source and you look different than they do then maybe if you're, you're suspect to some questions uh, we're working on the summary plan description summary plan description is a kind of a brief summary of the pension provisions we hand that out to everyone when they become hired and every time there's any kind of changes uh, that are substantial. We're going to rerun that. It's about 5,000 copies we're going to have to run. We've condensed the summary plan description. We used to have one for Tier 1 and one for Tier 2. We're combining that into one booklet now, and we hope to have that done right around the beginning of the next fiscal year. Um, we have a new custody contact at our custodial bank. Uh, Kim Henry was our client service person at BNY Mellon. And she's leaving to another group, and so we're getting a new client person there. And finally, we did receive a call down from Portfolio Advisors for $462,700, roughly. And that will be need to be paid within the next week. We're going to use cash to do that. So that's all I have, unless there's questions. How do you normally handle that? Is it one Yes. So we direct. So the first thing, based on our discussion uh, last meeting, is I'll contact Callan, will powwow as to what the appropriate vehicle to fund that would be. In this case, uh, cash balance was the most acceptable. You know, as Alex said, emerging markets we were kind of overweighted in in May, but it's turned against us in June. And so I think we're probably underweighted now by about that same 1%. If, you, if I was just to fathom a guess, they've really taken it hard because of the value of the dollar. Um, and the trade tariffs and those type of things, all that talk has hit them. And so where they were the outperformers, they're kind of the underperformer this month. And so we didn't take it from emerging markets, but we look where those out of balance positions, in this case, we decide to take it from cash. It's sometimes the quickest, and we only have like a week to fund this. But we instruct our custodial bank, uh, give them evidence of the call down, tell them to take it out of cash and wire it on the day that it's required to portfolio advisors. 
So, Robert, I sent you an email. I forgot until Alex had wrapped up his presentation. They, haven't, they didn't bring the periodic chart, and I would like to see that because I think it's important to show. I've gotten the questions of why aren't you heavier here? Well, it's going to change, I promise you. Correct. I think that's just good for us and the public to be able to see on a monthly basis to remind the turnover. Sure, the periodic chart is really easy to read. And you can cer certainly show you how the different asset classes move around in the performance arena. But that's all I have unless you have questions. So as a takeaway, if, uh, if you'd like, Pressy, we can, um, in our next facility, facility meeting, we can, um, we can discuss the security in greater detail. Robert's let us know he's going to put it in the budget, but if you want, do you want to see something like that come out of the committee? Well, I, I don't know. How does the rest of the board feel? If I'm the only one, I'll just go ahead and let it go. I mean, if, if we're talking four hours a month for something he's asking just for a, a, a feeling of, uh, of uh, security um, from from a city employee, I don't, I, I don't know that we're making a, a bit much out of it unless it's offensive to have a police officer out there. I don't really think it's a cost significance to the fund. Um, trying to hire private security, I think you'd be in, a, in a, maybe a little bit of a tough spot to try to hire somebody for 48 hours a year. Um, there may be a little bit of cost savings there, but again, not being a peace officer, I don't really think you're buying a lot of security. Um, so I, I think it just projects a little bit of professionalism and security just, just during our board meetings, I, I hope, and I don't think we'd ever need it. I don't think it's that. Okay, and, and I kind of maybe understand, but you know, I've sat on lots of boards, on Wells Fargo Bank Board, on hospital boards, you know, even the boards that I sit on right now, and, and we don't have a police officer there. And so I just, um, you know, I, I, again, if I'm the only one that feels that way, just go forward with it. But I'm just, um, I'm just like and maybe that's. Would you be comfortable? Let's 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 try it out. I mean, if we see it's becoming some sort of a, an issue or whatever, then certainly we can revisit it any time. But uh, literally one hundred and twenty dollars a month to have in the budget, I don't think is uh, a big and, and impediment at this point. I guess, I guess so. part of it is just I just we just got hit with it just right now, and yeah. it was like, okay, well, I'm not sure how I really feel about it. And I guess we don't have PD out here. They have a hired security because they're full time. So it's just, we weren't going to have that anymore. So I don't think we saw it as a drastic change. We were just trying to continue where we were going. So how would we do it? And it seemed like this was the most, you know, efficient way to do it if we were going to have an off duty police officer rather than going and trying to contract with a private security service. Again, like I said, I'm just not sure if we need it, but like, like if I'm I hope we don't. One, <laughs> Should we post this for the next agenda to have a more robust well, discussion on well, it? Well, that was a question or is if we're going to if we're going to discuss, I mean, if there's serious concerns by the board, I think we can send it through a committee. Right. But Presti's question is, let's let's. So, Rebecca, do you have a concern? Do you want to see a, a policy? Do you want to do that or let just. I'm okay with moving forward. I'm okay, okay with moving forward with the security service. Um, you're right. We have. You've never. I mean, you've been on the board longer, and I'm sure there's never been a need for it. Um, my thoughts are because we are going to be out in an, our new building. I think it's important for us to have one there. Um, another one of my concerns is we do have two city council members that are on the board with us, and uh, God forbid that anybody were to come after you. But you know, if people are following them and they know that we're out at a meeting where they're at, where there is insecurity, you know, and so for $120 a meeting, I don't think. It's a big deal. Those are my thoughts. I don't, you know, I, 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 I would feel more comfortable if we did have the, the police officer there for our board meetings. But you know, those are my personal thoughts. I don't see a need. <coughs> I don't see a need, and I don't know if you, uh, what kind of enemies you guys have. But I don't think that there, uh, there anybody would look at going after you. I mean, what kind of enemies we all have? Uh, I don't. I don't see a need that we need to have security at, at, at that, you know, for that. I, I mean, it, the, the money is not an issue. It's just, you know, again, I've been uh, around uh, this board and other situations, and I've, ne I, you know, I've never seen a need for security. And, uh, I mean, we dealt with the issue about uh, 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 concealed carry and stuff like that, and, you know, says I, I trust the retirees, and every trust I trust, uh, 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 you know that, that that's 
that's not a that's not something that we need to be discussing or having to deal with. I, I'd like to put it through the committee. My thought is it's not necessarily the retirees, it's people that are coming here with they didn't apply in time and we hold the power to either approve or disapprove their chance to receive a benefit and they may not be happy with our decision. But I'd like to see it go through committee. Who's on that committee? Mario, myself, and uh, Rebecca. Rebecca. Okay, so we already know the way it's going to go. So why even send it to committee? Well, as you said, it just got brought up to us. Right. They may have some thoughts about it before they meet again. Okay. I mean, I don't know. I, I like to deliberate sometimes on issue, not just always go with my gut feeling and think about it and do a little research. But I mean, and I, I, I don't mean to overthink this because I think this is something Robert would like to see for, for the meeting, and he has it in the budget. So we're really going out of our way to say this is something we don't want to have. That's... That was my only concern, not whether it's right or wrong to have it. That was it. But well, the other thing I got but, from Robert was that he allocated that into the budget. I, don't, I didn't hear anything, and I oh, well, maybe I'm wrong, where he said, I would like to have this. Okay. I mean, he just says, I'm, I'm putting this into the budget just in case. Yeah, right. So I was going to propose that in the, the new budget. The, the one benefit that I see is the compliance with the concealed carry and open carry policy to the extent that we're not going to have a metal detector. Okay. We're not going to have people frisking people as they walk through the door. And to the extent we would ever have an issue, which we may know, um, having someone there that can take care of the issue is better than me telling Pete to ask <laughs> He looks like a bouncer. All right, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> he looks like a bouncer. Um, uh, let, let me go ahead Sam did you want to add anything you know uh, folks you know I, I understand that you know it's never been an issue before but I'm a firm believer in uh, trust but verify and uh, I also subscribe to you know it's better to have and not need than a need and not have you know a lot of the uh, school shootings that have taken place <clears throat> you know they did not have on-site security they did not have armed guards they did not have a lot of things and it's always an afterthought. We are leaving the security of downtown. We're leaving security of City Hall. And uh, I think it's just something that we, we, we need to be vigilant about when it comes to security. Uh, no one ever thinks, uh, you know, someone's going to do something wrong. But um, if you have taken a look at the news in the world um, over the last few years, you know, um, I just, I just hate for us to have a situation, and uh, we've had this discussion, and we, we decided against it for $1,400 a month. I think it's something that we need. Um, Cassandra and I, I can't speak for her, but I can speak for myself. Um, I've had to uh, get uh, PD involved in a, lot, a few situations since I've been in office, and um, it's, it's just something that I think we need to think very seriously about because um, just because we, we we're going to go ahead and allow folks to carry carry concealed doesn't mean that that day someone like is going to carry we need we need dedicated uh, security uh, in everything that we do that's my take on it um, so I, I, I'm in under the impression that um, I'll just say this uh, for to for lack of a better word, I, I don't necessarily um, care one way or another. Um, but if uh, you're asking me how I feel today, I would say that I'm always in the community every day. I don't have any problem with being um, at board meetings with or without security. I was just at one um, at the Metropolitan Planning Organization, no security. Um, I think that um, you know this is a fund that we're supposed to protect and I will always um, try to cut back on, on expenditures that I would consider to be frivolous. Security is important, and so there is a fire station right across the street. Um, there is a headquarters right down the street um, for a police department, and so I feel safe, especially being with Representative uh, Morgan, who I, I feel very safe with at all times. So. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> My thoughts were more, do we have a security policy or are we going to develop one for the new building? Because you have the security alarm system and all that. We don't have a permit. Okay. You know, is this, 
did they forget to set the alarm at night? Did somebody break in and trash the place when they show up in the morning? So I, I think we need a policy, but I, I'll go ahead and support the security measure. So, so I think um, we, I think the gist is it, it'll be in the budget. Um, some, some don't care one way or another. I, I think uh, being proactive is, is the point. I, I, it, spending it, getting the most cost effective. So we're going down to just four hours. We're not proposing permanent security um, just for the board meetings, like we said, where we have the, the rulings potentially on the benefits and just to prevent any, sometimes the softest targets are the ones that are the most um, sought out. So it's, uh, they'll look for places that don't have that. And then to comply with our concealed carry policy, I think, think that's good. Um, we can look along the way, right, Robert, to see if there's, you know, lesser, op lesser cost options. Um, but I, we just, we're, we're going to possibly be having our, maybe our August meeting in there. We want to make sure there's something in place when we move in. We can always adapt with it as we need. Um, this was really just to have that. Um, opportunity in place so that we don't have to think about it reactively, but rather proactively. Well, I agree with the representative Morgan, and, and, and so I'll just go ahead and drop my concern, except that that um, I, I feel like I just got hit with something that I knew nothing about, and I don't like it. And uh, right. I appreciate and, and, that. And yeah. So, so uh, let's discuss it. Let's have let, let's go ahead and go forward, but let's have a security policy, like Nick was saying, mm -hmm. which is, which includes this. And, and I don't think any board member ever likes to hear something like this and all of a sudden, well, where is this coming from? Well, and I, I don't, I hope you don't feel like you got hit with it by surprise in the sense that this was something we're anticipating in, in an upcoming board uh, budget. So it really was not meant to be an issue right now. Is this, so it was good that we had the discussion, but we were actually trying to get ahead of being in the position, being in the new building with the new budget. Just so a big surprise. I yeah. guess. Right, I, I think this was more than bringing it up to be prepared for the discussion when it is in the budget, so we aren't surprised when it's in the budget. Correct. At some point, you've got to hear about it for the first time. Right. Yeah. But this feedback and whether we needed to send it through a policy is exactly why it was brought up. Well, send it back to committee. Go ahead. And my, my thoughts are approve it. Send it back to committee just to get a policy. For a general security policy. Right. Okay. We'll start, we'll be working on that, but we're, I think we're okay moving forward at least to have that in place for our new board meetings, correct? Okay. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so that concluded your report, Robert. All right, I guess we're ready for the next item then. Okay, item 18 is for notation. That brings us up to open comment period. However, there's no one signed up for the open comment period. Item 19, the board will retire into executive session pursuant to Texas Government Code sections 551.071 through 551.076 and section 551.078 to discuss any of the following. Section 551.071, consultation with attorney and 55.074, personnel matters. Discussion and action regarding an annual performance review of the pension administrator. Okay, so do we have a motion to retire into executive session? Motion. Uh, motion second, made by second. Nick, seconded by Presti. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, Aye. we're retiring into executive session.
Okay. You got my email. Man. Okay, do we have a motion to come out of executive session? I make a motion. Motion made by Pressy, second by Renee. No, Renee. I'm sorry, <laughs> Renee. Second by Mario. Aye. All those in favor? Aye. Okay, motion passes. Okay. Item 20 is adjournment. Well, we. Oh, we did take action. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I was, sorry, Robert. Okay, so do we have a, uh, coming out of executive session, do we have a motion? I'd like to make a motion that we um, accept the chairman's um, review of Robert Ash and give him a rating of 4.0, uh, that we give him a 5% merit increase retroactive to February when his evaluation, annual evaluation, was supposed to be done that his next evaluation be done this upcoming February so it will be continue on that normal year calendar that we give him a one-time lump sum equivalent to 5% of his new salary and that we give him covered parking at the facility second so we third it's not a business <laughs> it was a one-time lump sum okay. oh, so it's it's we, we defined the amount so let's define the amount. you want to define the amount it, it was it was based on five percent of of your existing salary. That's right. Okay. And this was in recognition for your outstanding work uh, in getting the building built and having to deal with the transition to whatever it's called the <laughs> PTG, you know, PTG and all that. Well, the staff is very very involved with that, and they deserve. The appreciation, well, but it's very unusual. You can uh, share your appreciate your, your, your kindness with them. And, and your support, as always, and whatever you. Oh, so, uh, we I have to vote on it. We haven't voted yet. Oh. So, <laughs> it, Eddie, I'll second you, it. <laughs> Eddie, are you comfortable with that motion? Yes, as corrected. As corrected. So, so um, I understand we have a motion to accept Robert's uh, performance review. Uh, which I prepared uh, that uh, his review cycle is uh, every February that he receive a 5% merit increase in his current uh, compensation and that he get a one-time merit increase equal to 5 per, uh, and that be being retroactive to February uh, 1st 2017 I'm sorry 2018 <laughs> and that he get a one-time Merit increase equal to five percent of his existing salary. Um, my anniversary date is January nineteenth, uh, but whatever date you want is fine with me. Mm. Okay, so the last evaluation was performed in February, so I think we'll stick with February because that's kind of what we discussed in the session. So. <laughs> there you go. Okay, so the motion was made by Robert. I second it. Second it by Nick. I'll third it. <laughs> Pressy? No, I don't have it. No, uh, pull vote. Oh, aye. Mario? Aye. Robert? Aye. And Nick? Aye. Motion passes. Okay, the motion passed, and that third part of, of the, that motion was the covered parking. Right, very important. There you motion. go. <laughs> Thank you very much. Motion to adjourn. I second. All right, that's item 20, right, David? <laughs> All right. So, uh, motion to adjourn made by Pressy, seconded by Mario. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. We'll see you next month. Congratulations.